everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So, I, as I promised, we're going to start in our continuing uh, study of the minimum span tree problem, look at Prim's algorithm. So this is the one we're going to focus on. Now, it's worth noting that sometimes this is called the Prim-Jarnik algorithm. This is because it's known that there's a precursor discovery of this algorithm by Jarnik here. Though oftentimes it's called Prim's algorithm named after Robert Prim. So here's the idea in Prim's algorithm. So in Kurs schools, what we did was we built spanning forests, and they're each their own little cluster, like seeds, that are spanning across to create one large tree. Instead, we're going to start off with some seed, which is just one vertex, so some starting vertex. And we're going to use the cut property that we seen last day improved directly to design the algorithm. So what do I mean by this? So imagine I pick this as a starting vertex. What we're going to do is I'm going to assume that, hey, look, this is V1. Everything else is V2. What did the cut property say we should do? If we want to find some, like there's some MST out there that has, that there's a special property we had. The cut property said we just pick the least weight edge between, say, vertex 4 and all the other vertices. So I would just select this edge, and then I would consider those that are, this is now V1, and then I would consider all those in V2, and I'd pick a least weight edge, repeat this process over and over again. That is Prim's algorithm at its heart. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with V1 containing the starting vertex. So I'll phrase things a little bit differently when we actually get to the algorithm pseudocode itself. What we'll do is we'll pick a, a least weight edge that crosses the cut from of uh, V1 and V2. So we pick, pick that least weight edge. And as we do this, we're going to add vertices to one side of the cut like I just described. If I started at 4, I would add 1 to this side of the cut, and then I would consider edges that span across the cut and pick the another least weight edge and repeat. So I need to have some way of accounting for this in some part of my decision-making process. So the way I like to think about it is like a cloud or more humorously is like a blob. So what we're going to imagine, now I'm not sure if you ever heard or have ever seen a movie called The Blob. And in that movie, there's this monster blob that starts off very, relatively very small. And what it does is it goes around eating things around it consuming more and more of what's around it, but it moves very slowly. So it likes to conserve what it needs to do, and it does this by spreading itself out over and over again, and it gets larger and larger and larger. So I want you to imagine this like a blob that's really greedy. So what do I mean? It's always going to, when it looks around itself, it's going to say, hey, look, that, that that vertex one looks really, really delicious. So it notices that this is actually like really cheap to get that get that vertex. So it parts it as a part of the blob. So it envelops those vertices as it expands. And when we're done, the blob has consumed the entire graph and everybody's gone, okay? <laughs> That's not fun. <laughs> So you can imagine like an amorphous blob that greedily selects the one that looks like it's always the least cost or least weighted edge. So the one that is the cheapest for the blob to get to. So it's worth noting that this strategy is it, it, it's a locally optimal strategy for Prim's algorithm to do this. So what does it do? Well, it looks at itself and says, hey, look, this is what I have so far, and I always select the one that is always the cheapest at that time from myself to all the other vertices. This is an example of something called a greedy algorithm. So a greedy algorithm makes locally optimal choices in the hopes of getting the global optimal solution. So in those, uh, those types of algorithms, you'll see more of these in 355. So Prim's and Kruskal's algorithm are kind of like the Ben Brunner of these kind of kind of algorithms. So, just to make this a little easier for myself, I'm going to I'm going to visualize this a little bit differently. 
So I want to create the minimum spanning tree. Now I'm going to adopt the mechanism that I did when I talk of breadth first search, just out of convenience. But it's very easy to tweak with this to have it so you have two separate arrays. So you're going to have some attribute associated with the vertex called D, which is going to consist of the least weighted edge that you've encountered so far in the graph. So for example, if I started vertex 3, naturally it's the starting vertex. Remember, the blob is right here, and the blob job is to consume the entire graph. Now, you can look at this as the root of such a tree, because remember it's a spanning tree. So I'm going to set its parent to be null, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that all the other vertices, I have not yet explored them, I have not yet considered them, so I'm going to assume that the least weighted edge, we don't know yet what the least weighted edge from some vertex to that vertex is, so I'm going to assume that this measurement D, which is going to keep track of the best known cheapest edge weight that I've encountered so far from some vertex in one side of the cut to the other side of the cut. So as we grow what the left side of the cut, V1, uh, we'll discover more and more of the graph updating this D value here. And each one of them will have a parent. No. All these are going to have no parent yet. Naturally, once you see this, remember we've seen how we can construct things like DFS and DFS trees. I'm just adopting the same paradigm here. So instead of returning the edges of the MST2, which you can get from this, uh, from this process, but as every time I pick an edge, what you'll do is you'll select the parent of, or what is called a predecessor, so the parent or predecessor of the vertex, and the other endpoint will be the vertex you're going to select, which has the least weighted edge distance cost to it. So that's how you can get the edges. So if you wanted to modify what I'm going to give to you after, very easy, you're just simply going to make it so you just add edges as you do this along, okay? Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to implicitly construct the graph, uh, our minimum spanning tree, from our input graph using these two attributes. Naturally, you might ask, is D in parent business? These can be represented as two arrays, and the classic way of representing this algorithm is using an array called capital D, and have a second array that keeps track of these predecessors or parents. So, where you came from. So you can naturally construct the MST this way. So for the sake of convenience and for what we're going to do later, I'm going to use them as parts of the vertex objects. So these are the attributes that are associated with each vertex. Okay. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start off at vertex me. Now, what I'm going to do is, remember, we're going to look at this like the blob. The blob is really hungry. It's just going to look across from all of these and try to figure out, hey, look, which one is the cheap, the, the one that's going to take the less work for me to get to at that very time? Okay. So I look at all of my neighbors or all the incident edges, and I look at its other endpoint, and I figure out what's the cheapest or least weight edge for me to get there to there at that time. Remember, V1 is going to be this right here. So this is the blob right now. The blob's right there. So the blob is going to look at 5 and say, okay, well, 4. And that means if I were to pick vertex 5, the predecessor or parent would be vertex 3, okay? Same idea. It looks at 4 and says, okay, well, I can get there with cost 2. And its parent is indeed me, right? That's how I would get there. And this one, I can see, I can see vertex one. So the blob, the blob doesn't really have eyes, at least at any stage at this point. We're not going to get into any details here. Um, it has this uh, cost of three so far, the least weight edge that we found so far, and the parent is three. I haven't yet encountered two yet, so I'm not going to update that. Now, what I'm going to do is, like I said, I'm always going to pick the least weighted edge from this 
which this is V1, V2 are all the other vertices. So I'm going to look at these three edges and pick the one with least weight. So what, which one is it? It's this one, right? So what you do is you would, you would uh, include, you would include this edge, and then the blob would consume this vertex. So it grows. Now, the mechanism for which we are going to grow the blob is going to be by marking vertices. So we're not going to consider vertices again once they've been consumed by the blob, okay? So now the blob has consumed this. So now what we're going to do is though the blob is now both these vertices, we're going to look at all the edges that go from V1 across the cut to V2 and V2 are these three vertices. So their cho the choices are, so now before I can do that, I have to make sure once I've made this selection that I update uh, this distance here. Because remember, this is now a cheaper one, right? So it's three versus one. So I'm going to update it and say, okay, well now the distance is one. And the parent is, is vertex four. Would I need to update this one? The one I picked? No, because every single time, this is the least weight edge. So as it gets consumed, there's not going to be a discovery of a better one. That's one thing you should notice. So as I do this, what which one should I pick? I got one, three, and four. Which one should I pick? I should pick this edge, right? So I'm going to consume, the blob is going to consume, consume vertex one. And now, now we got V1 is just vert vertices one, three, and four. V2 is two and five. What do we do? We look at our least weight edges. So I have three here. Now three is definitely better than, than in infinity, infinity here. So its parent would be vertex one. So, so what what would be what would we do here? Do I update this one? No, 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 no nothing, nothing improved. Now keep in mind when we do these updates, do I have to look at all of the edges incident on a vertex? No, I only have to look at the one that I added into the blob. Okay, so now the blob, you have to just look at the edges incident on the blob. Later on, when we talk about another algorithm, these are called edge relaxations. Uh, at least we're looking at a simplified version of it. We'll see the proper version when we eventually get to it in the later lecture. So what do I do next? I pick the least weight edge from V1 to V2. I have three and four, so I'm going to pick this edge. So by the way, this is the edge I picked before. I'm going to pick this edge. The blob has now consumed vertex two. So I now have these three edges. Now what are we going to do next? I need to update. But notice now I have, I have to look at my incident edges on vertex two. And you say, okay, well look, two is better than what it currently has here, right? Four, so I better update this. The blob has found a cheaper way of getting to five. Five is hiding in the corner in a box, okay? So the blob finally found this poor fellow. And there we go. So now what are we going to do next? I pick from, I pick the least weight edge, which currently that is being kept track of over here as two, right? So I pick this one. Now, do you notice that I don't actually have to go like, oh, well, I look across all the edges. I don't do that. What I do is I look at the D values. Do you see that? All I do is I look at the D values. I always pick the one with the smallest D value. So I just pick, so I add this edge in, and the blob has consumed the entire graph. And we're done. So notice that the minimum spanning tree just consists of the edges for which, if you look at this, four comma three, because the parent of this one is three. The parent of this one is four, so this is that edge here, so it's one comma four. The edge here is one comma two. So yeah, one comma two, because the parent of two is one. 
So you can see how you can get the tree. So let's write down Prim's algorithm. Do that algorithm. So this is going to be Prim. It's going to take in a graph G and a starting vertex S. Now, if you are not given a starting vertex, you just pick any arbitrary vertex in the graph. It doesn't matter. Because the graph is connected, we don't have to worry about what starting vertex we use. So you can just like roll an n-sided die and you can just pick one, okay? Assuming you can do it at some cost in time. So I'm going to assume the input is a connected, undirected, weighted I graph G. E and a vertex. I'm going to start writing on space S in V. And the output? The output is an, M, an MST of G. So, what do we do at the beginning? I need to initialize each of our D and parent values, or parent or predecessor values. So, I have four each. For each vertex of B of G, you're going to do the following. You're just going to go B dot D, I'm going to assign that to be infinity, and B dot parent is going to be assigned, assigned null. That's the first loop. The next loop, uh, before I do the next loop, I'm going to assign, just like I did in my example, I'm going to assume that the starting vertex is a D value should be zero because it's all we're, we're going to include it in as soon as we start doing this. So you're going to find that our loop is going to select. We're going to prime the loop by assigning this zero and it's going to start exploring. The blob is going to start exploring the graph. Okay. So this is just so that we can include S first. Then we're going to have a nested loop next. So for i is assigned 1 to n, we're going to do the following. And now you might ask, why n? It's because we're going to have to do this n times. The first time is going to put s in. Uh, so it's going to mark s and it's going to take care of s. And then each successive one is going to produce an edge in our MST. So we're going to need n iterations here. So I'm just going to start off with some variable called d min. It's going to be assigned infinity so that I can break it with some sort of smaller amount. So I'm going to have four each for each vertex, for each vertex b of g. You're going to do the following. You're going to do the following. So for each vertex, you're going to ask if B is not marked. Sorry, if you now nah, let's go with yeah, let's go with B. If B is not marked and and uh, B dot D is less than D min. So all we're doing is just finding the minimum. Uh, D value here, just like what we said we would do during the example. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to assign uh, assign the following. I'm just going to say that D man. I'm going to say D man is assigned uh, B dot D, and then what? I'm going to keep track of another variable called U man which I can guarantee this loop is going to give me. So you might nest, you might have u min up here and assign it to be null or something like that. And what we're going to do is I'm going to assign u min to be assigned v. And then all I'm going to do after that, so that's my first nested loop. I'm going to then mark Mark u min. So u min is going to be the one, the vertex with the smallest label. Then what? Now I'm going to have another loop. Now I'm going to, because I'm running out of space here, I'm going to write the loop up here. So 
So we're going to have for each, for each edge, uh, u min, comma b, we're going to do the following. So for each one of these edges incident on u min, we're going to do the following. So if the weight of u min v, so the edge u min comma v, is less than v dot d, so this is our updating process that I told you about. Then, so if if we find a cheaper edge, then we better update our location. Because remember, we're checking all the ones incident on the one that the blob just consumed, okay? Because the blob now wants to see if there's any better options in the next iteration. So this each iteration is going to represent the next choice the blob is going to consume, okay? So if I have this, then all we're going to do is we're going to say b.d is assigned w um, u min comma b, and its parent is going to get updated, right? This is exactly when we were doing those updates, and this becomes u min, and then we would have the, so this is the end of the for loop, then you have the end of the for loop, and then you have the end of the while loop. So that's the remainder of prim. Now, the analysis here depends, if you think about it a little bit, remember we have two common ways of representing the, the analysis of this algorithm. It depends on how we represent the graph, right? So we're going to focus on first on the parts that are relevant for both possible representations here. So, what do I mean by this? So, let's look at the time complexity. Now, there's two different ways we can represent the graph, so I'm going to look at the parts that don't really change between them first, and then there's going to be one slight tweak depending on which representation we're looking at. So we have this first loop where we go through read vertex and we update D and parent to be their initial values. How long does this take in terms of big O? Well, this is going to take something like n operations, right? I have to go through read vertex, updating those takes constant time. Okay, updating this naturally takes constant time, so this is going to all take linear time. Now, what do we have? We have two nested loops. We have one loop here, and we have the second loop there. Let's first look at this loop. Then we're going to find the analysis here. I'm going to be very particular. So I go through each vertex. And I check the ones that are not marked for each one of them. How long does this loop take plus the outermost loop? How long does that take? So this together, so this whole process of marking and doing all of this plus the for loop. How many times is this, how long is this going to take? So I go through each vertex. So this is regardless of my representation. I have to go through each one of the vertices and I do a potential, uh, I have to figure out which is the closest to the blob, okay, at that time by just picking a least weight edge. So what do I do? Remember, this is a really greedy blob. Um, what we're going to do, okay, I have how many iterations and of this, because I find the minimum. The marking takes constant time. So I'm creating these, constant time. How many times does this happen in total? N times, so it's N times N in total. So this is big O N squared time. This is regardless of the representation. However, this might slightly tweak over here. So if I go, so now I have this updating process. I go through each one of the edges incident on a vertex. I do this, how many times? How, how do I get all the incident edges? In an adjacency matrix, this takes me linear time to get. Any operation happening in here takes constant time, right? So what I do is I, I, I have to do this, this take big O of n, but the outermost loop 
will take, it has n iterations of that, so this whole thing will take n squared. So I end up with the adjacency matrix representation. You should expect the following for the adjacency matrix. You end up with roughly, roughly n, n squared plus, sorry, we have n plus n squared plus another n squared, right? This takes linear time. Then we have to do an n time, so it's n squared, which this is, of course, big O of n squared. So the adjacency matrix representation with prim like this takes quadratic time. How about for the adjacency list? So for the adjacency list, if I go through all the vertices that are incident, sorry, all the edges that are incident on u min, each one of these is to have to go through the degree of u min, but I do it for all the vertices. We know some property, right? It's called the handshaking limit. Handshaking limit says the sum of the degrees is twice the number of edges. So it means that this second loop here will be dependent, dependent on what? It'll depend on the number of edges because I do this for each edge incident on a vertex, right? How many of those are there? The degree of a vertex, but I do it for all the vertices. But how long, how, how many is that? That's, that's the number of edges. So in an adjacency list, you're looking at n plus n squared plus m. Now, we remember, we know something about undirected simple graphs. What is m related to in terms of n? It's m squared, right? So this is big O of n squared. So you could say Prim's algorithm in this classic array-based implementation, which I made a couple small little tweaks to it, this takes quadratic time. Now, I want you to notice very quickly that this, this, there's something that seems a little bit off about doing it this way. We actually know how to do some of these things actually better than this. So computing the minimum, this seems to be a bottleneck, one of the big bottlenecks of this algorithm. Do you see that? So if I consider an adjacency list, you'll notice that this, okay, this is like M here. This is something relating to M. Um, but at the same time, this over here, regardless of which representation I use, I always have to compute the minimum, this uh, minimum value for D. So I want to find the vertex with the smallest D. Can I do that any better? Believe it or not, we can actually tweak around with Prim's algorithm by using different data structures to improve the time complexity. So let's talk about that. So as I mentioned last day, I'm going to skip over the proof of correctness of prims. It's in the notes. You please take a look at it, and you'll see that it's just me applying the cut. So you use the cut property repeatedly, as I discussed last day. So what we're going to do is we're going to adopt a different kind of implementation here for prims algorithm. We're going to use a heap-based implementation. So instead of using arrays or just these attributes associated with each vertex, which is equivalent, um, what we're going to do is instead of scanning through all the vertices and finding the ones that aren't marked and finding the minimum, why don't we use a priority queue instead? Well, priority queues are really good at finding the minimum, right? What if I could just dump all the vertices in some way into a priority queue and then use that extract the, the remove min operation. So if I use remove min, how long does remove min take in a priority queue? It takes log n time. It doesn't take linear time or anything. It takes log n. So we're going to 
see how we can do this instead, right? So, well, so I need to make a couple of tweaks to how our heap works to make this work. So we're going to augment. So we're going to change up the heap a little bit. In particular, we're going to remember a heap is for a priority queue, so we're going to augment the priority queue as follows. So what we're going to do is I'm going to describe how you augment the priority queue, which is going to be underlying a binary heap. Uh, we're going to need to do one of these two things. So as long as you do one of these two things, you'll be fine. So you can maintain a positional array And I'll call it pos like this uh, for the heap. And that keeps track of the positions positions of entries. Uh, where each value, each value, remember each entry has a key and a value. We're going to assume that in this way of representing it, each value is indexed by 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. These will be your vertices, by the way. So, whenever bubbling occurs, a little bit of the bubbling, right? Uh, bubbling occurs in the heap or insertions, uh, removals occur. Just update update pause. So if say for example an element shifts to a different spot in the heap, you'll just make sure you update the position of that entry in the heap. So remember, you're going to have entries, each with a value and a key. I want to know if I can index into your array like this. So I'm going to say to get the position in the array of entry with value B, you're just going to access pos sub, sub B. So you'd access it using the value. So the value would be some value between 0 and n minus 1. So, so as you're doing these updates, so if it bubbles up or down, you would just update the relative position for which the entry with that value exists. It's really quite simple. So for example, if I have an entry in say position five in the heap and it bubbles up to position two or something, one or two, then what you would do, every time you perform a bubble, like you swap, you would update this array respectively. So that's one way. This is one classic way of doing it. So you just keep around this array inside your priority queue. Another way is you just simply just store in each vertex object or the entry itself entry itself its position in the heap. You're just going to keep track of that in your object itself. And then you just update like above. So you're going to find in this version of how we're going to do things, each entry is going to consist of a key. So if I give you some vertex, the key is going to end up being b.d. 
and the value is going to be v in this version. In the first version, what you do is your whatever we use to get the position would access your array and it would just simply access pos sub v and that will be what it's going to index into and you'll find the position accordingly. So I'm not going to worry too much about the details here, but the big point here is that is that there's going to be one more operation we're going to add to our priority queue. It's going to be called decrease key. It takes in the value of an entry and a new key, k prime. And I want to implement this operation for my heap-based priority queue. So what is this called? What does this do? It decrease, it decreases the key of entry k comma v uh, uh, to k prime from from k. So we're just going to change the key from k to k prime, and it's quite simple. When you do this, you have to make sure you update the heap. So what way would things bubble? And would it bubble down or bubble up? Well, if I always assume that k prime is less than or equal to k, it's only going to bubble up. So what happens? You would just do one of these two things. You would access. You're just going to access. So how you, would you do this? So this is the kind of the algorithm sketch. You access. You access uh, the position of KV uh, change K to K prime. Then, then you're going to bubble up. You're just going to bubble up, just like what you would do if you imagine this being inserted in. What's the algorithm? You're just going to access the position of the entry using one of these two. Because remember, you have V. So V will have access and know there's some way of using V to get this entry. You're just going to change it to the key to K prime. And then you're going to perform bubble up. Okay? How long does that take? Well, I can access these things now in constant time. So I just take big old log n. So all my operations on the heap are going to take big old log n. So how is this going to work now? So believe it or not, that's the only change we need to make. And this algorithm is actually going to get a little bit simpler. So I'm going to modify what we have here a little bit. So what am I going to do? The train is excited. What am I going to do? I'm going to just change up this loop quite considerably. Okay, so I got rid of all the rest of the pseudocode. This part doesn't change at all, but you're going to find I'm going to have a very much the same structure. But all I'm going to do is instead have a priority queue. So I'm going to let Q be a priority queue, be a priority queue, that contains all the vertices and each each entry is v dot d comma v where this d measure here that's the key so do you see why this is going to be very advantageous for us? So if we just use the k, the d values as our keys, we can use the heap to take advantage of its remove min operation. As long as we do this properly, we're okay. So I'm going to have a while loop. While q is not empty. So the way you've got to look at this is slightly differently. So I'm going to dump all the vertices into a heap, and I'm going to remove the one with the smallest d value so far. 
This is going to, every time I pull it out of the priority queue, that's the equivalent to me, the blob consuming it. So you got to almost imagine the blob just sitting there at a dinner table and it's just, the priority queue just gives the blob the next one and it just eats it, okay? So, so that's how you got to imagine it. Imagine like the graph just sitting here on the table and it's just like oozing out into the blob's orifice. I don't know. Uh, the point is, is that we can use, to get you min, I'm just going to use q.remove min. So this is just going to pull you min, you min into the blob. Because I like to call it the blob sometimes. I think it's like a cloud if you want to be gentle. I, I think blob is far more graphic. <laughs> now, you could technically mark the vertex, but it doesn't really matter at all in this algorithm, the way we've tweaked it, because now I'm never going to need to determine if one is marked or not. Why? Because that vertex, as soon as I remove it from the priority queue, will never ever be considered again. So it's like the equivalent of marking that vertex. So once it's out of there, I don't have to look at it again. And now I just do my update for each, for each edge. So this is the second nested loop again, except I'm going to make a small change to it. U min comma B, we're going to do the following. So I just do my update again, just like again, I have if the weight of u min comma v is less than v dot d, then what? Then I have I had two things I did. I updated the distance or d value. You're gonna find why I'm gonna call it the distance actually when we get to our next lecture. So v dot d is going to be the weight of of u min comma v, so this edge right here, just because I found a shorter one, right? And then I'm going to update the parent of v v u min, just like before. And then I had up with my loop, and that's the end of a prim. So prim's a little shorter now. However, there's one thing I need to add in is my decrease key operation. So when I do these updates, I need to make sure I update the structure inside my priority queue, the heap. I have to update those because these D values might change and I have to make sure these changes are reflected in the priority queue. Does everybody see that? So I'm going to perform Q dot decrease key, decrease key, and I'm going to give it U min. Sorry, I'm not going to give it u min. I'm going to give it v uh, dot. Uh, so do I give it v dot v or v? I give it v because that's the that's the value. So our value is a vertex, and then I pass along the new updated key that's going to change. So decrease key on v comma v dot d. Remember, v is the value. V dot d is the key I'm going to change to the entry. So K is going to change. So K, the key K would change the V dot D. And there we go. So all I did is that small little change. So I just swapped out the data structure and now we have this variant of print. So this is the second one I'm going to show you. So let's do our analysis. Now I go into more detail in the notes. So I'm just, just for the sake of time, let's talk about how this works. So anyways, let's analyze this new variant of prim, but I'm going to use only the adjacency list representation for the sake of time. You can always go through this with an adjacency matrix if, if you like. Um, so anyway, so all of this, uh, so I wrote up a couple of small things here already. So to create this priority queue takes how long? N log N time. So big O of N log N, because you have to perform N insertions into the priority queue. Then what happens? Let's look at this again. Now you want to imagine this remove min operation like if it was your old loop that you had where you're selecting u min every time. The priority queue is taking care of that. Each time you remove min, it takes log n time. Then what happens is you do it n time. So it's this 
plus this outermost loop. We'll take n log n. And now, you have to deal with the second nested loop here. The one we had from before. Let's talk about the adjacency list. So, we know we have to do that, that linear set of operations. Then we have n log n in play, right? That's these two here. And then we have this second loop plus the while loop together. So we, for each one of the vertices, we consider all of its incident edges. Because we do this for each vertex, right? You mean it has to be every vertex at some point. Remember, the block devours the entire graph. So I just go through each one. But what's this? To get all the incident edges takes the degree of that vertex, which is u min. And for each one of those, I perform how many operations? It's not constant anymore. Decrease key takes how long? It takes big O of log n. So this means it's going to be the degree of u min times uh, log n operations, roughly. But I do this over all of the vertices. So this is really just the sum of the degrees times log n. But what's the sum of the degrees? That's two times the number of edges. So that's just how many? That's It's going to be roughly two times m, but I'm just going to drop the constant here just for the sake of time. So we know this is going to be m log n, which this is big O of n plus m log n which the graph is connected, so we know that there's a relationship now where m is at least n. So I can just simply just drop the n and just say, okay, well, it's big O of m log n. So we can solve the, the minimum span tree problem with m log n. Now, you might say, Dan, that's pretty neat. If the graph is pretty sparse, this is going to work better than the quadratic one, right? If the graph is sparse, it's going to look roughly like n log n. Now, so the big point I want to show by illustrating this for you is that the different choices we make about representing the graph and different choice of data structure changes how we analyze the algorithm and how we proceed in potentially implementing the algorithm. Now, you might say, okay, well, Dan, can we do any better than this? I'll give you one example. Uh, so this will be the last thing I'm going to say today, is that notice that I use the heat-based structure here. Now, there's actually another kind of heat that you can use to improve the running time even further with an adjacency list. So let me just write it here. So what can I say here? So if you use an adjacency list plus a something called a Fibonacci heap, which I'm not going to have time to talk about here, not in this course, uh, Fibonacci heap. If you use both of these together, so you switch up your binary heap for a Fibonacci heap, and keep in mind, all of this is going to be true there, just the structure of the heap is a little different. Uh, you can make Prim's algorithm take uh, take big O of M plus N log N. So like I said, when the graph is roughly sparse, this will look like N log N. However, if you use this, this type of heap, you get linear in the number of edges plus that best scenario that I said where the graph is sparse. So this is better. So my whole point here is I want to show you how you can solve a problem using different data structures and how the analysis might impact that. So next day, we're going to come back and we're going to look at something called the shortest path problem, which is going to be closely related to the algorithms that we've seen so far. So I say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. See you later.